Hi, my name's Leanne, Leanne Longfellow, and I'm going to be talking with you today about the presumption of competence implications for educators. And I'll just fill you in on my background. So I was a teacher for 30 years and I taught students with disability. But what really changed for me was when my first daughter was born and she has severe multiple disabilities. And that gave me a real interest in uh, not only special education or inclusive education, but also social justice for students with disabilities. Uh, and so that's what I do today. I'm very much in that space, in the disability community space, and I work with teachers and I also work with parents around inclusion. And this presentation is addresses the Teacher Standards 1.6 strategies to support full participation of students with disability. And the learning intention of this workshop is to introduce the notion of competence. And some people prefer the term potential, but I'll be using the term competence today because that's the better known term. So to introduce the notion of competence and how this influences the education of students with disability. And there are three success criteria. So at the end of this presentation, we'll be revisiting this slide again so that you can determine whether you have met the success criteria by listening to this presentation. So the first one is, I can define presumption of competence and state how this belief can be translated into action in the educational context. The second one is, I can state the benefits of the presumption of competence for students with disability and their peers. And lastly, I am mindful of the limitations of the presumption of competence and how this term has been misused to defend practices that are not validated. So in terms of definition, so to presume means to believe or to accept that something is true and to proven otherwise. So it's a bit like being in a court case. So you're, you are innocent until proven guilty. And so it's the same thing around the presumption of competence. So we believe that students are competent or have potential until we have clear evidence otherwise. And competence means the belief that a student has the ability to meaningfully participate in education and potential. Some people prefer to use the term presume potential, and that means having the capacity to develop. Now, the reason why some people prefer the term potential is because the term competence some people take that to mean that every student with a disability is another Stephen Hawking. And what we know is that intellectual disability is real and it exists and we need to cater for those students. And I'll be talking a bit more about that as we go along in this presentation. One of the things that's really, really important and that I like to start every presentation that I do is regarding unconscious bias. And we all have unconscious bias. So we can all be ableist. So even people with disability can be ableist and take a view that disability is a deficit. And it was Thomas Kuhn, who was a, a philosopher, who defined paradigms as shared worldviews. So these shared worldviews are so strong and taken for granted that it takes a sudden and dramatic break to this way of thinking to bring a change of view. And Kuhn was responsible for the well-known but much misused term paradigm shift. And I'm going to be talking about having a paradigm shift in the way that we view students with disability. What we tend to view, do is we view students with disability Sometimes we view them in a deficit way, particularly when they are students who do not communicate verbally because we privilege verbal communication. And if students communicate in other ways, sometimes we view them in a, in a deficit way. And I'll give you an example with my daughter. My daughter doesn't speak 
and she uses her eyes to communicate. And whenever we're out and about, we'll often have people just stop and have a conversation, which is just lovely. But there are many, many people in the community who just take one look at her and assume that she has very limited understanding. And they will speak to her in a way that demonstrates that. So they speak to her in a very loud, they often shout um, at her, which is interesting, and uh, but not terribly helpful. So they don't speak in a normal tone and they often speak in a very babyish sing-song way. And, and so that is telling me and telling my daughter more specifically that they do not view her as someone who's competent because of her, her disabilities because of her physical disabilities. And so, and that's just an assumption they make just by in, in the first glance. So that's what we're talking about here about unconscious bias. And we all have unconscious bias. Doesn't mean that you're a bad person if you have unconscious bias. What I'm suggesting is that we all need to reflect on unconscious bias. I have that, I have unconscious bias, and even people with disability can have unconscious bias regarding other people with disability. And we certainly see that in the disability community regarding intellectual disability. Someone said to me the other day, intellectual disability is the wicked problem of ableism. And ableism is the belief in the superiority of the able-bodied existence. And what I sometimes see in the disability community, and the disability community can be wonderful, and they certainly are wonderful advocates, but sometimes I see in the disability community, they distance themselves from certain disabilities. So I, I often see people distancing themselves from the notion of intellectual disability. They take go to great lengths to point out that they don't have an intellectual disability. And certainly in the terms high and low functioning um, is an example of that, where people like to point out that they are high functioning and they like to distance themselves from having an intellectual disability, therefore establishing a hierarchy. So it's a, it's a tricky issue. Um, and we'll be talking a bit more about that as we go along. So we're going to go through a number of questions and this is all about looking at your unconscious bias that we all have, that I have, and just for you to reflect upon your response to these questions and whether it's a yes, whether it's a no, or whether it's a maybe. And like I said previously, it's not about whether you are a good person or a bad person, it's about acknowledging that we all have unconscious bias toward people with disability and what we need to do is to reflect on that and take action if we become aware that we have a viewpoint that is not helpful for our students with disability. So the very first one is you recognise your students may understand far more than they can demonstrate. So just have to think about that, whether that is a yes, whether that is a no, or whether that is a maybe. And if your response is yes, fantastic. If it's no, then just have, just reflect upon that idea and where you may have got that idea from and that we are all a product of social conditioning. So we're not born being ableist, it is the way that we are conditioned in our society. And it's certainly if you're a maybe as well, just, just reflect on that and think about uh, how you can recognise that your students may have potential. And the next one for you to contemplate, you speak to your students in an age appropriate manner. Although you may adjust this for each student's personal preference to incorporate fewer words or softer speech. And this is something that I see a lot, talking to students in a baby voice. And that may be appropriate if that is what works for them. But what we need to do is not to assume that 
just because they have a disability that that is the way that you should speak to them. And I think it's it's great to start with an age appropriate manner and to adjust as evidence presents that uh, the student is not taking on board or not responding to what you're saying and adjust it as you go. But always start with the default that students understand what you are saying and that they are to be spoken to in an age appropriate manner and not the sing song voice, unless there is a specific reason to do that. And I think, you know, if you've got um, staff that are speaking to students in a sing song voice, it just needs to be reflected upon the reasons for that. And if you choose to use that, it needs to be discussed and discussed with the student and their parents or guardians and to whether that is a strategy that you wish to incorporate, that, but the default should always be in an age appropriate manner. So the next point is you find ways to support the communication of your students through words, picture symbols, sign language, speech generating devices, vocalisations, eye gaze and gesture. So it's really, really important that if students cannot communicate verbally, that they have a multitude of other ways of communicating. And even if they can't communicate verbally, there are all, always times that it's great to have access to a whole range of different ways of communicating. And certainly within the deaf community, regarding Auslan, they privilege Auslan, they privilege sign language over verbal communication. They say for them, it is a way of having a whole language, whilst verbal communication is very difficult for them. So it's a way of giving language to children that they may not have if they are forced to speak verbally the whole time and use that as the default position. So they use Auslan as their preferred form of communication. So you just need to reflect upon your ideas regarding students using multiple ways of communicating and recognising that that is okay. The next one is you pause and wait for a response, any response not just verbal, in a conversation. So giving that wait time for students, and that's really important and that's all about respect and respect and giving them the supports that they need. They may need that extra time, extra time to process what has been said and extra time to respond. The next one is you treat each student with a presumption that they have a rich set of thoughts, feelings, opinions and ideas they may be unable to express. So just have a think about that, whether that's yes, no or maybe. The next one is you acknowledge your students with disability in the same way you acknowledge a student without disability. And in this I'm referring to when you greet your students in the morning, are you greeting them in the same way or are you greeting your student with disability in a different way? Sometimes we like to overcompensate for the fact that they have a disability and treat them differently because you really, you're trying really hard to be inclusive and as teachers we all want to do the right thing and we want it to be successful, teaching students with disabilities, but maybe there is that overcompensation and they're not being treated the same as other students, they're not being treated the same as their peers and this could result in stigmatisation which is not helpful. So just have a think about the way that you greet your students, you acknowledge them in the, uh, when they enter your classroom and is it, are they all greeted in the same way? And there may be a very good reason to greet a student with disability in a different way and that's okay. 
if there is a specific reason for that. But if there is no specific reason, maybe that's something that you need to reflect upon about the way you acknowledge your students. The next one, and this is a really, really important one. You avoid speaking about your students in their presence as if they are not there. Instead, you speak to your student directly and offer them the same amount of respect you would offer anyone else, even if they cannot respond. Even if they cannot respond. So certainly people, adults with disability in the disability community, talk about this all the time and it's one of their real bugbears, that they will be out and about at the shops and might be... Uh, with someone with a support worker supporting them and they will be purchasing something but the shop assistant will respond to the support worker not to the person with a disability who's handed over their credit card and they find that really insulting and the same goes for in a classroom we need to be speaking to the student directly and not to the SSO or the ESO who is supporting the student and we do not speak about them as if they are not there. It's really important that they are a part of what is going on and certainly a part of the adjustments that are made for them, that they are consulted about that and the parents or guardians are consulted about that and that they have a voice in the whole process of education and that is really important. The next one is also, oh, these are all important, and this one is a very important one. You hold up your side of the conversation, even if your student with disability is unable to hold up theirs. So what that means is if you're having a conversation and they're not able to respond, it doesn't mean you just stop. It means that you keep trying to interact and build that connection, and that's really important. And the next one, you do not limit access to education based on an assessment because assessments are important. It's important to have data and, and evidence-based practice and assessments, but it doesn't tell the whole story. So just because an assessment comes back that a student has an intellectual disability doesn't mean that you restrict their access to education. So that's a really important one. We don't make assumptions based on an assessment and, and really limit what the student has access to. Communication. Now, communication is really important. So we've addressed all the issues regarding implicit bias. And one of the biggest issues with implicit bias or unconscious bias is around communication because we make assumptions about students with disability based on their ability to communicate. And communication is assumed to signify intelligence. And almost all activities in the school context are linked with the act of communication. So it's really, really important that we look at ways of enabling our students to have access to communication. And if students don't have that, certainly within their NDIS plan, and if a student is unable to communicate, I would assume that they have NDIS funding and would have access to speech pathology. And it's really important that staff work with speech pathologists to support students' access to communication. And that's really important. The next one is school class placement. And presuming competence is closely linked to inclusive education, and that is where students with disabilities are, have the opportunity to be educated alongside their peers. As students with disabilities often need to prove their competence to receive a placement within general education. And that is discrimination when they have to prove that. And what we should be doing is 
assuming that they do have competence and I'll be talking later around the issue of students with intellectual disability, which as I said before is the wicked problem of ableism. It's one that, you know, I certainly haven't got my head around. I've um, done a lot of study on this and I have, my daughter also has an intellectual disability and different various, different members of my family have fluctuating capacity regarding their cognitive ability and it's tricky. But what we should be doing is the default position should always be to presume competence and that is really important. Now, the whole notion of the presumption of competence, it was initially coined by Anne Donnellan in 1984. And she came up with this quote, and it might be a quote that you are familiar with, but it's a very popular quote that's talked about a lot. And Anne Donnellan said, the criterion of the least dangerous assumption holds that in the absence of conclusive data, Educational decisions should be based on the assumptions which, if incorrect, will have the least dangerous effect on the likelihood that students will be able to function independently as adults. So that's Anne Donnellan in 1984 who stated that. And it's, uh, people talk about this a lot, the least dangerous assumption and the presumption of competence. And I'm going to explain this a bit more, but in a very simplistic way. And it's a whole lot more nuanced than that, but I'm going to break it down in a simple way. And this is a slide that some people have problems with, and it is problematic because uh, I've, I've presented it as a binary. And in real life, it is not a binary, and it is not as simple as this, and I acknowledge that. But this is just a starting point to introduce you to the notion of the least dangerous assumption. So I've got two, two areas here. So the first one is, I assumed my students could not learn, so I educated them in a way that reflected that belief. I provided a poor learning environment, low expectations, and limited access to the curriculum it appears I was incorrect. So, so you've had the, taken the position that your students had, were not able to learn because of their intellectual disability. And so your curriculum reflected that. It wasn't a rich curriculum. And students were reflect, uh, restricted in their access to the curriculum. But then you find out down the track, many years down the track, that the student didn't have a severe intellectual disability that they were capable of learning. And so, as I said before, this is um, the binary. I mean, nobody would actually do that, would they? But I'm presenting it like this just so you can get your head around the least dangerous assumption. The second option is, I assume my students could learn, so I educated them in a way that reflected that belief. I provided a rich learning environment, high expectations and access to the curriculum. It appears I was incorrect. So you give them every single opportunity. You give them a rich curriculum, access to all sorts of learning, friendships with, with their peers, and what you find out at the end is that they had a severe intellectual disability. But which is the least dangerous assumption? It is, it is the second one. So if you give them every single opportunity and you find out that they do not have that potential, but you've given them every opportunity, then that is the best way to go rather than not giving the opportunity and then you find out that you're incorrect. So, and I realise this is a dreadfully flawed slide and I've been criticised for having this in my presentation, but I stand by the fact that it's a simple way to have access to the notion of the least dangerous assumption. And of course, it's more of a spectrum. We have various points on the spectrum in, in the least dangerous assumption and it would never be a binary. But I hope that has helped you to access that, this idea.
So I'm going to talk about Cheryl Jorgensen's work. In 2005, she talks about the assumptions behind the ideology of presumed the presumption of competence. And the first one she says is that traditional assessments are flawed. These assessments measure and show what students can't do right at that moment, rather than what they could do with proper supports. And we'll be talking about proper supports later in terms of Vygotsky's, the zone of proximal development and growth mindset. So they are really important. But I believe in evidence-based practice and I think assessments are very helpful and it's helpful to have data to show us where our starting point is. But we need to keep in our mind that these assessments don't give us the whole picture and I think most of you would agree with that. They just show us a snapshot at this point in time and if that a student has a psychological assessment, it may demonstrate that they have an intellectual disability, but that shouldn't limit that. And what we know is that students who are given the opportunity to communicate and given devices to communicate, sometimes, but not always, sometimes they demonstrate a whole lot more that they know than, than what we first predicted. Another point that Cheryl Jorgensen makes is that expectations matter. So when teachers set appropriate learning goals for students and expect growth, they treat students in a different manner than if they expect them to fail. And that's really important. So that's why we need to reflect on our unconscious bias about the way that we view our students. Because what will happen is if we are not expecting a lot from our students, it will seep into the way that we teach without us even being aware of it. And, and that's how unconscious bias works. And I'll give you an example of my unconscious bias. I completed a doctorate in 2018 and I, I stated at the beginning of my, my thesis that it was based on the social model of disability and that you know it is the environment that creates disabilities more so than it's being something intrinsically within a person but one of my examiners pointed out that that wasn't a consistent theme throughout my writing and that I had this unconscious bias seeping through in the way that I wrote because of my social conditioning and so I had to go back and I looked at that and it wasn't until it was pointed out to me that I realised that. And it's the same today when, you know, sometimes my social conditioning, uh, you know, I'll come out with things that are not helpful for students. For example, sometimes I use the term nonverbal and someone pulled me up on that and said, well, how about using a strengths-based approach and stating how students communicate rather than the fact that they can't communicate. So it may be that if they're nonverbal, if they're not speaking, they use other ways of communicating. So they might use their eyes or they may vocalise and we could say that that is the way they communicate rather than saying they're nonverbal, which is a very deficit way of describing their mode of communication. The next one is very important. Science without value causes harm. History shows that making decisions with the science at hand today without values can be dangerous to students' education, such as institutionalising students with disability. Now, I'm one who is all for evidence-based practice, and it's really important that we use data and evidence-based practice. But when we look at that without value and without incorporating the views of the disability community, we may make decisions that are not helpful. And segregation is one of those. So what we know from the disability community is that segregation can be damaging. And it is far better for everyone. And in fact, evidence shows this. The evidence shows us that for students with disability, they learn a lot more when they are educated alongside their peers. And their peers learn a lot about disability. And it creates for a 
more harmonious society, and that's really important. So we always need to use science with value and listening to the voice of people with disability. So access to communication is another point that Cheryl Jorgensen makes. So research on access to communication. Research also shows that when students have a reliable means of communication, the initial assessments of intelligence have often been proven wrong. But not always, because intellectual disability does exist. And I'll be talking about that a bit more as we go along. And presuming competence leads to more options in school and after. In the individualised education program or plan, or we call it here in South Australia, the one plan, parents and students should share their vision of the future to help teachers form individualised learning goals. And those learning goals should be strengths based and based on the presumption of competence or potential. So there should be growth. And, and that is really important. And it's really important that parents and students have a voice in, in those plans. So presuming incompetence can be harmful, especially if the educator is wrong. So to guard against this, individual education plan should focus first on a student's strengths and not solely on their disabilities or deficits. So we should have strengths in there and their, and their interests. So education should be based on interests and incorporate that into the curriculum and social goals as well. So that students are learning alongside their peers and learning to interact with their peers. Because what I find interesting is Sometimes when we have students who have difficulty with communicating, we put them in a class with a group of students, you know, maybe 11 other students who also have difficulty with communicating with the aim of working on communication. And that doesn't work terribly well. So what is good is to have, is to presume competence and have students in classes alongside with students who can communicate with them and that everybody is learning. So the student with a disability improves their communication and the peers in class, the other students, learn about disability and learn a positive view of disability. And that is really important, that, that within this, there's a social justice perspective and a positive view of disability. So not viewing disability as a deficit, but as something positive that people are proud of. So we certainly see that in the autistic community where they are proud of having autism. And we certainly see that in the deaf community. They are proud of being deaf. They don't actually see it as a disability. They see it as culture and as a difference. It becomes tricky when it comes to intellectual disability. And as I said before, that is considered the wicked problem of ableism because we never hear about people being proud of having an intellectual disability. There's not a great deal of literature and not a great deal of discussion on that. But certainly what I believe is that those students with intellectual disability should be honoured and valued for who they are and respected. And without that, that is when harm occurs to those people in our community. And we've seen a lot of that in the media recently, where we've heard a lot about people with disabilities being harmed in our society. And so what I'm talking about is having a strong social justice element in the curriculum that weaves its way throughout the curriculum that guards against harm. And presuming competence is the least dangerous assumption, so based on Anne Donnellan's 1984 quote, because the consequences are not as dangerous as the alternative. So that was that slide, that binary that I gave you. And as I said before, that is a simplistic presentation of that. But the whole notion of presuming competence 
gives students with disabilities the best options, the best options for them to have a rich education. So we're now going to talk about how we can put presume competence into action. Here you'll see a slide of the Communication Bill of Rights. This is one that I got from Teachers Pay Teachers and I got that for free. So I like Teacher Pay Teachers. There's some fantastic resources there and there are some that are a bit average. But this is one that you can just sign up to Teacher Pay Teachers and download this for free. The reason that I like this is Kilparan is a school here in, in Adelaide and I interviewed a teacher there, Sarah, who talked about how she uses the commu Communication Bill of Rights. She puts that up on her wall. Well, firstly, she talks to everyone about the Communication Bill of Rights and the, the human rights that students with disability have. And what she does is whenever she feels that a student is not having their rights held up, she just has to point to the Communication Bill of Rights on the wall, which is something that everybody has agreed with. So, you know, it's not just slapping it up there and saying this is what we're doing. It's about having uh, a mission statement, you know, talking about the values and beliefs that everybody has who's working with the students. And so it's something that is referred to for all the students that they have human rights the human right to have access to communication. Because sometimes what I would see when I was a teacher, and I was a teacher for about 30 years, students who used a form of AAC with augmentative alternative and augmentative communication, they might have had an, an iPad with something like ProLoquo to go on it because they couldn't speak, they would communicate with their device, through their device. And sometimes I would have people say, do they really need to take their device when they go to the toilet because it's not hygienic? And I would say, yes, absolutely. You know, they may need to communicate so they have their device with them the whole time. I've also had people say to me, oh, and this is quite a common one, they can't take the, the student shouldn't take their iPad into the playground because it could get damaged. And yet, why would we think it's okay for the student to go without a voice for 30 minutes at lunchtime when they're playing? Um, sometimes it's a risk we need to take and we need to work around teaching other students about the importance of AAC and not to, to remove a student's device, but they need to have access to their device at all times. It's really really important and we also need to educate students about the Bill of Rights so that they know that they can advocate for themselves, that they can have a voice. And I know of teachers who have programmed specific messages about their rights on their communication device um, so that students can, can talk about it themselves. They have access to that communication. And we also need to think about the links between tricky behaviour and the right to communicate because there is that link between behaviour and communication and that's something that we need to reflect upon. And the slide that you're looking at now is just another another version of the Bill of Rights and, um, and which as I said before that's really important that we that we acknowledge that our students have rights um, over and above the students who do not have a disability. And this is the tricky part of this presentation about students with intellectual disability. Does the presumption of competence apply to students with intellectual disability? Does it apply to students who have profound intellectual disability? And as I said before, this is the wicked problem of ableism. It's tricky. But Dr Sheridan Foster wrote in 2014, 
do we automatically assume that incompetence is a worse state? That people found to have a profound intellectual disability are lesser people who haven't reached their potential. Because what can happen is, it's really important to presume competence, but we also have to acknowledge that intellectual disability and profound intellectual disabilities do exist. And those people, those students still need to be valued and honoured for who they are. They need a huge amount of respect because they, they do not get that in our society. And even within the disability community, I believe there is a hierarchy and that students with intellectual disability and particularly those with profound intellectual disability are the ones at the bottom of the hierarchy. So what we do not want to do is, of course we presume competence, but we also need to educate our students and use data and evidence-based practice and have combined that with a huge amount of respect for students with intellectual disability. And we need to be aware of labels. Labels can be very helpful. There are many people with disability who talk about when they receive their autism diagnosis, how things made sense for them. It gave them a sense of identity. It gave them a positive disability identity because they were able to say, hey, I'm autistic and belong to the autistic community. However, the flip side of that is while there are many benefits to labels, it can also be stigmatising. So certain labels, particularly the label of intellectual disability, can be very stigmatising and can be harmful. So it's not, not a situation of saying labels are bad, it's the way that we use our labels. And certainly we need to look beyond labels. I've heard of cases where parents have said that they felt that professionals involved with their child will go to the filing cabinet and, you know, get out material on, say, Down syndrome because the child or the student has Down syndrome. And that's where labels can be harmful. When we don't see people as individuals, we need to see people as individuals behind the labels and we need to acknowledge the functional aspect of their disability. So not all children with Down syndrome are the same. Not all children with autism are the same. They are all unique individuals and we need to look at the functional way that their disability presents and provide adjustments for that. And our society has failed to create a safe space for people with intellectual disability and to recognise people with disability, in particular those with profound intellectual disability, as citizens. And that, that is something that is tricky and it, it's, you know, I, and I don't have any easy responses to that. And we've certainly seen that with the NDIS. The National Disability Insurance Scheme tried to work on providing supports to people with disability without using labels and just by using, addressing the functional aspect of disability. And we try and do that in schools through the nationally consistent collection of data. And we certainly try that, but it's, it's tricky, it really is. But what we need to do is, I believe, to focus on positive disability identities and to acknowledge that people with intellectual disability are citizens but also we need to educate them for where they are at. So when we are presuming competence, we don't actually put them in um, a harmful situation because we have presumed competence. We need safeguards for those people because particularly people with, and students with intellectual disability are far more likely to end up in the criminal justice system and are far more likely to experience abuse and neglect in our society. So we need to make them citizens, but also have safeguards. And that's a big call, and I don't have any easy responses to that, but just would like you to contemplate uh, your thoughts about that. And, you know, and, and there's no easy response to that. 
big issue. I'm going to talk about how the presumption of competence interacts with other theories that we use. And one is Growth Mindset by Dr. Carol Dweck, who talks about expecting that each person has the ability to grow and to learn, and that is a growth mindset, and that students need to have a growth mindset. We need to cultivate that in our classroom rather than having a fixed mindset. The trouble with growth mindset though, and it has limitations, is that when we are educating students with disabilities, we shouldn't just assume that this is inherent within them. What we need to have is high expectations coupled with adequate supports. So when things are not working and students are not learning, we don't just say, oh, you know, it's because they have a fixed mindset. No, because that's blaming the student and seeing disability as intrinsic. What we need to do is look at the environment and ensure that there are adequate supports within the environment for the student with disability. Another theory is Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. So Vygotsky states that we ask students to meet a performance goal beyond their reach and, and if we do that, if it's beyond their reach, they will become frustrated. But the opposite is true. If students are only exposed to tasks in which they are capable or can complete independently, they will become bored and disengaged. So using the zone of proximal development, goals should be one step out of reach and supports or scaffolds put in place that enable students to reach these goals. And the presumption of competence fits in beautifully here. So what it means is that we should believe in the potential of all students to learn unless assessment demonstrates otherwise. So we begin teaching at their age level so we don't underestimate our students, but we also need to give adequate supports so a student is successful, but also not to overcompensate so the task is completed without effort. So, it, so it's a juggling game, isn't it? It's, it's certainly about using the data to know where our students are at and moving them one step beyond where they already are. So there are opponents of the ideology of presumed competence. And Travers and Ayres in 2015 wrote a paper that you can download on a site called ResearchGate if you'd like to read more about what they state. They claim there are no published studies of presumed competence in the professional literature and there is no empirical evidence for the efficacy of presuming competence. So the term presumed competence has been misused over the years and this is a very, very controversial topic and even last week I was contacted by a parent who was very upset about me talking about this and some people in the disability community will find this tricky. But the term presumed competence has been misused and it has been misused within facilitated communication. So that is where students have an adult who guides, supports their hand as they communicate. The speech pathology organisations within Australia have deemed facilitated communication as not being evidence-based. So therefore it is not a data-driven evidence-based practice. And facilitated communication has caused a lot of grief in various communities. There have been cases where children have started communicating using facilitated communication and suddenly have pointed out people who have sexually abused them. Unfortunately, in some cases, it was the adult guiding the child's hand and there have been claims against parents that they have sexually abused children and 
in court, this has been proven as false. And it's, it's a tricky issue because what we do know is that students with disability are vulnerable to sexual abuse. And, and so this is a very tricky, controversial area, but what it has been deemed by people who are much more knowledgeable than what I am and by professional organisations is that facilitated communication is not evidence-based and we should try to avoid holding or guiding our students' hands as they communicate. There was a very big case with Rosemary Crosley, who for those who are of my age <laughs> will be familiar with the movie and is coming out. And that was that was a wonderful movie about a girl who was released from an institution. But Rosemary Crosley helped Annie communicate and used facilitated communication. And that has now been deemed as not evidence-based. And I know that there are various viewpoints on that, but the viewpoint that I take and that I would encourage educators to take is that we are guided by our professional organisations and we are guided by the evidence on that and that we do not use facilitated communication in our educational context. So we are at the end of this presentation and I'm going to run through the success criteria and the success criteria that I presented at the beginning was I can define presumption of competence. So just have a think about that. Can you define that? Can you state how this belief can be translated into action in your educational context? The second success criteria, I can state the benefits of the presumption of competence for students with disability and their peers. And lastly, I am mindful of the limitations of the presumption of competence and how this term has been misused to defend practices that are not validated. Have you met those success criteria? There is a booklet that goes along with this presentation. So please feel free to download that and have a look at that. And thank you very much for listening to this presentation.